Hey, it's your open source advocate and I'm back with another video and today we're going to talk about human resource management. Now, when you want to build a business on open source, as your business grows, you will likely have employees. You may already have employees and you just have been trying to figure out how to do things with spreadsheets and Word documents and some kind of online storage and that's not really the best way to do it. Finding great open source software takes a little bit of effort sometimes. So I'm gonna cover a few different hu human resource management projects. You'll have to kind of figure out which one is the right fit for you, but I think there's some really, really great options out there. Now I've been digging into this. I am not a human resources person, so I'm doing my best to figure out what looks like it's a really good project, what is current, what's been kept up to date, and right now we're gonna start with Orange HRM. Now one of the things you want with human resource management is the ability to track employees, make sure you know what you need from them, maybe do some recruiting, maybe do some training, maybe have leave management and things like that. So over on Homebox, after I put that video out, I got this response and this request. It was from Satej Shendi. And he's asking about this very, this very subject actually. So where he says, software recommendations for leave management and employment profiling. Now I'm not sure what employment profiling really means in this context, but leave management, I can definitely talk about. And there's several really cool projects out there. I'm gonna kind of look at a few different ones, but today we're gonna to look at Orange HRM because it's kind of a full package HR management system. It's open source. It appears to be pretty well kept up to date. They've got a lot of information out here about it. So if you just kind of go here and hover over the different links, you can see what they're talking about. So they talk about HR administration, employee management, reporting and analytics. If you come on down, You've got talent management, so again, you've got recruitment and onboarding, which is really important. I've seen some other really good onboarding software as well, so I'll cover that in the future too, but onboarding new employees is sometimes kind of a tricky thing, and having a really good onboarding process makes it just so much better for a new employee. I recently took a new job, and their onboarding process at the time, because of the pandemic, was all virtual, all online. It was great. They went through a lot of the corporate stuff, but you know, when it came to how do I sign up for my benefits, how do I sign up for my retirement plan, how do I sign up for those things, it was a little bit light on the actual how-to. It was very good on the here's the places where you'll go, but they didn't really give you the detail that I look for so that I really understand what I'm doing. And when I was setting up my insurance benefits, I somehow accidentally left my wife off of the medical, which was not great. I, I was unhappy about that. And then I had to wait until open enrollment to add her, which was meant she was uncovered for about six months, which I, I just really did not like. So really an onboarding process is, is an important thing. So make sure whatever you're doing for onboarding that it's a really good onboarding process. Payroll connector. Now this is not a payroll system, but it's got a connector that can attach to different payroll systems apparently. You've got the PTO and leave management, which was the request on YouTube there. And then you've got time tracking, which we've talked about a little bit before with Trago. So we'll kind of see what their time tracking looks like as well. And finally, when you get to culture, that's another really important thing inside of a company is setting up a culture where it makes people feel welcome, makes them feel empowered, makes them feel like they can really get to work and do their job and be trusted to do it well. So you've got performance management, culture development, and training through like a learning management system. So if that's all built into this thing, that's really awesome. It's open source again, so we can get out there and run it. So when we jump over here to the GitHub page, you can see two months was the last time somebody made an update, but that's pretty recent, three months. Then you've got like five years, but maybe this is just something that didn't need to be updated much. So when you really look at this, you see that there's some fairly recent updates, which means that this is probably being kept up to date pretty well, which is awesome. Now they've got a lot of information. They've got the starter application and really, they give you some different ways to do this. So you can install it on Linux, and if you go read these directions, it's a very manual process, but if you like to install things straight on the metal, then, then this is something you can try. You can install this on Windows. They have instructions for that as well. They have the HRM starter installation guide and then updates guide. So if you wanna go here, they've got this starter installation guide and they tell you, hey, go download this file and we'll help you run through a web installer to get everything set up. But then they say, before you start, you need to have Apache, HTTP server, 2.2 or later, PHP, 7.4 or later, MySQL, 5.5 or MariaDB, 5.5 or later. So they're telling you, you've got to go get all these other things first and install those, then we'll help you get our stuff installed. Then they tell you they want you to use an AMP stack and so on and so forth. And if you're comfortable with these things, jump on it, have at it. But you know me, I love to use Docker. It makes things so much simpler. So there's a great little project out here that just pulls the latest orange HRM Docker file, 
and, and basically helps you get it all set up. So this is what I'm going to use because to me, this is the simpler way to go. Now, this could all blow up in my face and it doesn't work at all. We'll find out. But this is the way that I want to do the installation today. I think it'll be really straightforward. And if we can get everything up and running, that'll be awesome. And you guys will be able to get it up and running and check it out for yourselves. So stick with me and we're going to get in the installation right after this. I want to say thank you to all of my subscribers and all of my patrons over at Patreon. Seriously, you guys make this so worth it for me to do these videos every week. I really, truly enjoy it, and I just can't say thank you enough. If you're enjoying these videos, subscribe. Let YouTube know that I'm doing a good job by subscribing to the channel. Plus, you'll get notified when I have new videos coming out. And finally, if you're enjoying what I'm doing, give it a like. Just click on that thumbs up. And that way YouTube knows that you like it and they'll pass it along to other people that might enjoy my content as well. I really appreciate it. Thank you again. Let's get started. All right. First thing I want to do is I want to get onto the server where I want to install Orange HRM. So I'm just going to open up my server list here in Tabby. It's pretty easy to get servers open. I'm just going to click on the one that I want. It's going to go and it's going to log me into it through SSH, which is awesome. I'll clear this out and I'll make the text a little bit bigger for you guys that are on the mobile devices. So I want to create an actual folder for Orange HRM. So I'm going to do this command. If you look, I've already got a Docker folder here. And inside that Docker folder, if I do ls dot slash Docker, you can see I've got a bunch of application folders that I've already created for different applications that I run right now. So when I want to create a new folder inside of that Docker folder, I do mkdir dash p like Paul Docker and then slash whatever I want that new folder name to be. So I'm gonna call this orange HRM. What this says is make the directories that I've listed. If this directory already exists, don't create a duplicate, but instead just use the one that exists. Then check and make sure that this one doesn't exist and create it. So it's a really nice, simple one line command to create the directory structure that I like. I keep all of my Docker stuff inside of a Docker folder then when I want to back it up, I just zip up the Docker folder and create a backup of it. And I've got it backed up on a different system. And then I can just unzip it and get everything back up and running exactly the way I had it. So I'm going to CD. I'm going to move into that folder. That's what CD means, change directory. So I'm going to go to Docker, Orange, HRM. And now we're going to create a Docker Compose.yaml file. So we're going to do nano space Docker hyphen Compose.yml. That's going to open up in the nano editor. I'm going to jump back to my browser and I'm going to grab this code right here. This YAML code. I'm going to copy it. I'm going to jump back to my editor here and I can either right click and pick paste or you can do control shift and V in the terminal on, on Linux and it'll paste either one, whichever you want. I'm going to get rid of these extra spaces. They're not necessary out there. Now there's a few things we need to change on this. So we're going to go back to the top and kind of go through it one line at a time. He's got extra spaces here I don't think are necessary. So let's just get rid of that. There we go. So we've got service is going to be called orange HRM. The image is going to be orange HRM slash orange HRM and it's latest. We're going to do restart unless stopped. I like this option. Now you can do restart always, which means if the server reboots, bring this thing back up. Restart unless stopped means if the server reboots and it was running, it's going to bring this back up to running. But if the server reboots and I had stopped it manually, it will not start back up on its own. I have to tell it to start back up because maybe I'm doing some maintenance. Maybe I'm changing some things. Maybe I'm fixing something and I don't want this thing to try to start back up right away. I want it to wait until I'm ready. So I like restart unless stopped. Now he's got some ports mapped here. So inside the container is on the right side of the colon. So this is going to be 80 and 443, very standard ports for HTTP and HTTPS. But on the outside of the container, he's using port 8200 mapped to port 80. So that's great. That means our host needs 8200 to be free, which is fine. And then 8443 for 443. Now, I know I use 8443 on a different application, so I need to change this. So I'm gonna change this to 8243 because I don't use that one yet. And since it's pretty close to the 8200, I think that's awesome, but I'm actually gonna change this to 8280 and then 8243. Now, if I'm already using 8280, it's gonna give me an error and I'll have to come change it. But for now, I think those are both open ports on this host. Next thing he's got is environment variables. So the first one is the HRM database host, which he's 
got MariaDB. That's great. Now he uses the database user root. I'm going to set this up as my name. I don't want to use root. I don't think that's a very secure way to run things. He's got a really simple HRM password here. I'm going to change this to something kind of long and strong. So I'm going to do four words that have nothing to do with each other and a number with some capital letters in them. So let's, uh, let's create that real quick. So let's pick four words that don't have anything to do with each other. Let's call this banana. And then we'll pick another word and let's call it ocean. And we're going to put a number there, eight. And let's pick another word, um, any word that doesn't have anything to do with a banana or an ocean. Uh, let's pick uh, live oak. And then let's do one more word here. Any word that we want, Dalmatian. How about that? So that's pretty long. It's got a mix of upper and lower case characters and a number and symbols, the hyphens. And it's something that people probably wouldn't be able to guess. So this is the kind of strong password that you want to have. Now, the database name is Orange HRM. We don't need to change that. The PUID and PGID we'll just leave alone. And then he's got a volume where he's saying dot slash, which is in the current directory where this Docker Compose file lives, which is what we want. That's where we want this to be. He's going to create this called Orange, and he's going to map it to uh, inside the container a folder called Orange HRM, which is fine. He says it depends on MariaDB. It links to MariaDB colon MariaDB, which is fine. And then down here, he defines out the MariaDB image part that we need. So he's going to pull MariaDB colon 10.2. Again, restart unless stopped. Love that. His volume, again, he's gonna have a DB folder here on the on the host side. So it's dot slash DB underscore orange. So we'll see that get created when we run it. And then he's gonna map that to slash var, slash live, slash MySQL. So it's got that MySQL data inside of this volume. And we can keep this maintained. So when we recreate this, this container to do updates, we'll still have our data. Very important. Now we changed this up above these two values. So we're going to change this to Brian, which is my username up above. And we're going to change this to that password that I created up there. And instead of trying to retype it, I'm just going to go back up and I'm going to copy it. I'm just going to highlight it. And in the, in the command line, you can do right click and copy, or you can do control shift C to copy. Then we're going to scroll right back down to where that was. And we're just going to come up to this position right here. And we're going to right click and paste, or you can do control shift V to paste. Now we've got everything changed inside of this file that we want to change. We're going to go down here. I'm going to take out, we can leave that one space there. That's fine. So let's do control O. It's going to ask us, is this the file name that you want? We're going to say yes. Now we're going to check this one more time. We've saved it. So that's good. Double check everything. Make sure we didn't mess up any spacing because YAML is space dependent. You do not want to use tabs. You always want to use spaces. And you want to make sure it's spaced correctly or it'll it'll complain. So now that we've checked it, we're going to do control X to exit out of the terminal and we're pretty much set. So we're going to do two commands, but we're going to concatenate them with an ampersand sign. So we're going to do Docker, maybe Docker compose up dash D. So it's Docker compose space up space dash D. That's the first command that says bring up this Docker compose file and get it running for me. And then run it as a daemon. That's what the dash D is for, which means if I exit this terminal, it doesn't kill the Apple application. It lets it run in the background. Now we're going to do two ampersand signs and we're going to tell it the second command. We're going to say docker hyphen compose logs dash F like Frank. So this says after you bring up this Docker file, show me the logs for what's happening in it and just keep showing them to me as they change. And then we can get out of that when we're done looking at it. So we're going to hit enter. This thing's going to go out and pull down MariaDB first because it's depended on by the other image. Now it's going to go out and pull down that orange HRM image. Now we should get two done messages. There's one. There's the other. And it's going to start showing us the logs. What we want to watch for in the logs, because it scrolls by pretty fast, you just want to watch for things where it's like error, I couldn't do this, you know, had this problem, ready for connections. It looks like everything worked pretty well, so that's good. So we can just do a control C to get out of those logging. That's fine. And we're going to go back to our terminal or to our browser here. We're going to open up a new tab and we're first just going to go to this by IP. So I'm going to put in the IP of my server. 
All right, once you go to that IP address, you'll come to a page that says, how do you want to set this up? And we're going to run through this wizard real quick. So we're going to do a fresh install. We're just going to click next. Now, when you start to do an upgrade, you would, of course, pick the upgrade an existing installation. When you hit next, it's going to bring you to the license. It's an Apache. Uh, no, it's a GNU uh, version two license. So that's good. You're going to come to the bottom, check the box and then click on next. And here you need to set up the database. So we want to pick that it's an existing database because we've already created it. It's just empty. Uh, we're going to put in the root username or the host name, database host name. Yeah, so that needs to be the name of our host in Docker. So we can go back here and we can just do a Docker compose PS command. And I'll make this a little bit bigger text again. So now we're going to type in Docker compose PS. That'll give us the in information that we need here, which is this is the name that we want to use. So we're just going to highlight that, right click, copy. We'll go back to the browser and we'll just paste it in right here. The port is correct. Database name is orange HRM altogether. The username is root and we're going to put in that password that we had. So we can go back to our terminal and we can do cat docker compose.yaml and right here we can copy this and we can go back to the browser and we'll paste it in. We're going to say encrypt the data and let's just click next. And once you get past that step, now the reason we have to use root is that it's going to use the root user to create a non root user for orange HRM. So it's just asking for that information so it can go in and do the database stuff that it needs to do here in just a second. So we're just going to go ahead and get past this system check. Everything should be good since we're running in Docker. That means they've already got the software that we should have. So we're going to click on next. And it's going to ask for a few pieces of information. So I'm going to put in my organization, but you could put in yours, of course, and you should. Uh, country, I think US is already here. Yes. Now, something funny about their drop downs. If I do this and I don't actually go and find it in the drop down list and click it, it won't take it. It'll act like it's not there. I'm not really sure why that happens. It's kind of strange, but it's fine. I'll scroll down here. I wish it would kind of search through the list so I could just pick it faster, but it just doesn't work that way. So we're going to click on United States language. We'll go find English United States in my case. And uh, let's see. Time zone is America. Chicago. I'm almost there. There we go. English United States, America, Chicago. Everything there looks good. We'll click on next. Once you set yours up, just click next. Finally, you need to put in an employee name for your admin user. So again, just put in the name that you want to use. And then you're going to put in a contact number if you want to. It's not required, but we do need an admin username. So we'll just call this uh, Brian and my password that I want to have is a strong password here. And once you get the, the little message to go away that says that the passwords don't match, you should be set. Now it says register your system with Orange HRM. So I'm not going to do that because it's going to mess up their stuff with a bunch of test systems. But you can definitely leave that checked if you want to and then click next. Now they're going to confirm all the details that you just put in. You're going to click on next one more time. And it's going to start doing all the things that it has to do. So it's going to go out. It's going to create the database. It's going to get a bunch of stuff set up and ready. And then it should move through these other steps. Now, I think this goes decently quick. I, I, it took about two minutes the first time I did it, but be patient. Give it some time to run. So that time it took about 25 seconds. It really didn't take any time at all. But once you're done, just click the button one more time. It says installation is complete. And now we can actually launch Orange HRM. So the installation part is done. Now we're just going to use our user that we created. and the password that we gave them as the admin user. Remember, this is your admin password, not your root password for the database. And you're going to log in. Oops, maybe I typed it wrong. Oh, username. If I do that instead of email, that should help. There we go. So when you first come to the, to the main screen, you'll have this dashboard that you can kind of see some stuff. Of course, there's not going to be much in it yet because you haven't started configuring the system. So now we're going to get into configuring the system so that your users can start using it. 
All right, now that you've got the system up and running, there's some things you need to do in order to make best use of it. So we're gonna go up here to admin, and across the top, you're gonna to see different tabs with a lot of different things that need to be set up. Now I've set up some of this stuff already in my system. Initially, you have user management, and you can see I've added a second user here. Then you've got job. And you really wanna go through each one of these things in this list and actually set it up. So here I've added a couple of job titles. Then you wanna go in and set up pay grades. So you just wanna go straight down this list. So again, I've set up a couple of pay grades and you can see that the forms are pretty simple here. You're just gonna put in the name of it and when you hit next, so we'll just go ahead and put this as uh, SE2. Then it's gonna ask you about salary range. So you've got SE2 named here. You're gonna do currency. So in my case, it's US dollar, US dollar. So then you put in the minimum salary, maximum salary you wanna provide. So let's just say 125,000 and 150,000. And then you can hit save. So once you've added some different, some different pay grades, you're, you're set. So you can next go to employment status, so you want to add a few different types of employment status. So in my case, I just added contract, full-time, part-time, temporary seasonal, pretty standard stuff in the US. Job categories is also pretty important, but they have a few already filled out. You can add more, you can delete the ones you don't really need, but they have a few here already filled out. So I was just able to use those. And then work shifts. I went ahead and created a work shift. Just feel free to kind of set up the ones that you think make sense. Maybe it's just a regular weekly kind of thing. When you're finished with that list, you want to go to this next one. You really want to do all of this setup up front or you're going to have a hard time trying to get the system to function properly because you need a lot of these values already set up in the system for your users to choose from and for yourself to choose from for different tasks. So you have general information, locations. Again, go in and set up at least one location. It could just be your home office, something like that, but you may have more than one office. That's fine. And then you can use the structure if you need to, but this is really where you set up your organization. So if you have more than one organization that you're supporting in the system, you could add them here. But since I've only got one, I just left it like it is. Next thing you wanna do is go over here to qualifications. So under skills, again, you can add qualifications if you're doing recruiting. I haven't set this up yet because I wasn't doing any, any recruiting, but then they have education. So you see, you can fill out all of these things. So you might wanna go through and fill all this out. Uh, nationalities is already there, so you can add that, you can add to that or keep the ones that you have or take out the ones you don't need. You have some corporate branding options, so here you can change colors. As you, as you can see, it was orange. I've changed this to blue just to kind of be something a little bit different, but you've got several different places where you can change the colors, enable and disable things, upload logos and all kinds of stuff to make it a little bit more like your own system if you want. And then you've got email configuration. Now I have not set this up yet, but it would be very useful for you to go through and set up your email uh, SMTP server settings. Just make sure you know what your settings are so you can get those set up. Once you've done that, you've got email subscriptions that you can also set up and use for your users, but also for yourself to be able to subscribe to different email notifications and activities. You have localization. So we kind of set this up in the, in, in the initial wizard, but if you need to change anything, you can do that here. You have your language preferences, again, different things that you can add, take away, turn on, turn off. You have modules, pretty much all the modules are enabled. This last one I can't enable and I'm not really sure why unless it's something they want you to pay for, which is fine, but uh, anyways, just know that you can enable all these different modules. So the social media login is not set up yet. It looks like they're gonna add that at some point. And then the same thing for using the OAuth uh, client is not set up yet, but you do have the option for LDAP. So if you're using an LDAP server, you can go through and actually set up LDAP configuration as well so that your users can just log in with their normal credentials for their work systems. So really great stuff here, but definitely worthwhile to go through the admin configuration and get everything set up and make sure you go through each thing on the list and set it up. Again, if you're not doing recruiting, maybe not useful to do it right off the bat, but something you might want in the long run. So it might be worthwhile just going and doing it and getting over with. But right here, definitely go through and fill these out or it's going to be hard for you to do the rest of the stuff in the system that you might want to do where it comes to like leave and attendance, different things like that, where you're trying to get people to kind of put in their information. 
So in management, whenever you come to admin, you're, you're going to be brought to this user management screen every time first. So this top part is a search. You're actually searching for users in your system because as you get tens, twenties, hundreds, thousands of people who work for your company, then being able to search very quickly is going to be useful. So it's really a nice feature, but I keep, I keep typing up here thinking I'm starting to add people into the system and that's not how it works. When you want to add, you want to come down to this next card down below and click on the add button. It'll bring you to a form and you can basically go here and pick out what's their role going to be. ESS is going to be most people. That's employee self-service and then the employee name. So you're looking for one that's already in here. And so if I type in VE, you'll see that I get my, uh, my employee here that shows up. Um, this is not where we're actually going to add a new user. So we're going to cancel out of this and we're going to go here to personnel. We're going to add and this is where we're going to add a new person. So you go to PIM, you're going to add the employee, you're going to put in their name, all the information that it asks for. And kind of this first screen is very simple, but then you're just going to hit submit and it's going to give you a page with more information that you can fill out. So I've already added one person. So let's just add another person, another made up person here. And so this is a family company. There's my employee ID right here. And it says create login details. So I'm going to tick that box and you see now I get to create a username for them. Now at a regular company you might want to do like uh, you know some companies do first initial last name some companies do you know first name dot last name just trying to keep it so that everybody has a username that's pretty unique and that's fine um, you want to make them enabled if it's not checked already and then you want to create a good strong password for them and it tells you what the rules are down here at the bottom for your passwords which is you've got to have a capital letter, a number, and a symbol. And you'll see it says, okay, I'm happy now. Now we've got to retype that. And once you've got them where they're matching, it'll tell you, hey, those match fine. Now we can do save. Once we save that employee, it'll bring us to the form where we can keep going with our edits. So we can put in a driver's license number, and we can put in the license expiration date. So we could put in, you need to follow whatever the mask is for your, for your system because the localization will determine how your date is laid out. So make sure you follow that. In, in case of the US, it's month, day, year. That's just kind of how we do it. Um, let's see. So if we're gonna do nationality, that's fine. Just find the country that that person is actually a, mem you know, a, a citizen of and pick that. And again, these drop downs are kind of weird. You can't just type to get it, but in this case, I think since I'm defaulted to U.S., it assumes U.S. and you would pick a nationality that's different because it doesn't list U.S. in the list. Marital status, single. These are all just things you can fill out, but you don't have to. And then if you have any attachments, you can add those as well, but then you can save this data and you've got this person added, at least from that standpoint. So you've got some basic information there, but you can also go and you can say, are there any dependents, immigration, what their job is. This is, a, this is kind of an important one, right? So... You can put in the date that they're starting, which could be today. Job title, they're gonna be a software engineer one. No job specification there. Job category, so this is professionals. And full-time worker. And again, you can include employee contact details if you want to, it's very much up to you, but you can save that. So now we've got some job details for this person. Salary is the next thing you want to go and set up for this person. So make sure you just kind of work down this list as you go. And we're just going to, and the reason they let you add more than one is because you may have people who do one job part of the week and another job the other part of the week, and you're setting up their salary structure based on those jobs. Assign salary component. So that's going to be, ah, here we go. Yeah, so this is going to be SE2, even though it's an SE1 job, that's fine. So again, how are they, how often are they going to get paid? Bi-weekly. Currency, in my case, I only have United States dollars, but you would pick if you had more than one. And then here's where you set the amount, and it tells you what the min and the max have to be. If you try to set it below the minimum or above the maximum, it's not going to let you do that. So we're going to start this person at 135000 And comments. And then include direct deposit details. Again, if you want to do that, you can tick this box, and it will give you, you know, expand those things for you to fill out. If you don't, it's up to you. It depends on how you're going to be paying these folks and where you're going to handle your payment processing from. So I'm going to just hit save. And it always gives you this nice little toast message to let you know, like, hey, you did it. It saved. So that's pretty nice. Um, who do they report to? What's the what's the structure for this person's reporting? Do they have qualifications that you need to list and memberships to anything that you need to list? Again, this is all stuff you can set up in the admin section ahead of time. 
So now that you've got this person, if you go back to admin and user management, you can scroll down and you can see we've got several different people here now that we've got set up in the system. So we've set up a new user. The next thing we want to do is kind of look at what do we need for leave management. So when you come into leave management, the first thing you're going to be brought to is the leave list. So this is really a search. Again, be aware that these top cards are usually some kind of search with a bunch of filters. So you see these filters, you can change them, you can do whatever you need to, but you're searching for leave requests and things like that. So down here, you can see that I've got someone who's got a leave request and I've got the ability to approve or reject it. And I'll show you how this gets set up here in just a minute as a different user so that you can see how this got set. But right here inside of your leave list, as long as you haven't filtered it out somehow, you'll have this ability. And when you click on this approve, it's going to go back to them as an approved leave session. But right out of the gate from your from your leave area as an administrator, you should see this. And as long as you've got people who are your reports, that's that's who your stuff's going to go to. So back here where we're setting up that new user, we can go into their uh, file here and we can go down to reports to. So we didn't fill this out a while ago. But as you come in, you've got assigned supervisors. So you can add who their supervisor is. But if they have if they have subordinates, you can also add subordinates under this person. So if you're hiring them as a management position, you might want to go ahead and do that here. So since we're going to do this, I'm just going to go ahead and put myself and it should find me through the search. And then reporting method is direct. You can have direct or indirect reports and we'll save that. So here in leave, you're going to go to configure. You're going to set up your leave period. So I set this up as December 31st. I don't know why, but it wants to, to go to like the following year. Um, it's kind of weird, but it, it catches 2022, even though we're in 2023 and does it till the end of 2023. So that's why I set these two dates. So you just pick from the drop down, pick what you want, and then it kind of sets this current leave period. Um, it's kind of strange that it, that it wants to set it this way to me and it doesn't let us pick a year, but there you have it. That's kind of how you need to do it. Once you've set up that leave period, then you go down to leave types. So in here, I added a few different leave types. I added family medical, I added sick leave, and I added vacation. But when I was adding them, I'll kind of show you what this looks like. Uh, it says vacation, and then is entitlement, um, is, is entitlement situational. So if you click on this, you'll get a little bit more information. But what this means is like maybe it's maternity leave, jury duty leave, those things where really the person is entitled to do that by law. So you need to make sure that you're checking those things for yes or no, because if it's a yes, you really can't say no to it. It's probably illegal to decline that type of request. Um, so just be aware of that. But in this case, it's just vacation. So I hit no and I'm going to hit save. And there we go. So we've got the, the vacation types set. On this page here where it says work week, you can set up what your work week looks like. So you may have the five day work week. A lot of places are going to a four day work week. So we can say non-working day for Friday. So people have Friday, Saturday, and Sunday off, which is nice. And then you can also set up different types of days for holidays. So very important to put that in for your country as well. All right, so I've opened up my HRM system in a private window now so that I can log in as a different user. And in the background, I've still got the, the other window open as my admin user. So I'm going to log in here as my new user that we just created. So this is their first time logging in. We send them, hey, here's your username, your password, and they can change their password inside when they're ready. And hopefully they put in their password correctly and it'll log them in. And this is what they see when they first get in. So you notice they don't have admin over here because they're not set up as an admin. They're set up as an employee self-service user. So to give an employee a certain type of leave, you can do this differently for different employees because sometimes companies have a policy that says if you've been here five years, you get more time off. If you've been here 10 years, you get even more time off. So when you have a new employee, you want to set them up with the basic time off maybe. So we're going to go look for our employee. We're going to select what she gets. So we'll set up vacation first. This is the leave period, and then here's the entitlement. Now this is in days, not in hours. So we're gonna say that you get 10 days of vacation. We're gonna save that. So now we can see that she's got vacation. So we're gonna go back here. We're gonna add another one. I'm gonna do the same thing. We're gonna pick that employee. So you can tell that the group adding is gonna be much quicker, but it's something you have to do when you onboard new people. All right, now that that's set up, We'll go to our dashboard. 
we're going to go back to our employee here and you can see that it looks very similar but we're going to go to leave for the employee and I say you know what I want to request leave so I'm going to go here and I'm going to say apply so she has all these different options she's going to pick vacation and she has 10 days of balance so we're going to just pick that day here uh, not February I want March 17th to March 17th and it lets you choose half day morning half day afternoon uh, specified time or full day which is already selected and we can just put in right here what's going on and <laughs> so I marked it where there's no working days on Friday so we're gonna say the 16th there we go that was my fault but it did tell me hey they didn't mark any working days we submit they get a green check mark that says you've applied for leave which is great and if I go back as the supervisor now I have two leave requests to approve so again I can jump here I can see the two different leave requests and I can say you know what you're approved you you're approved as well so I've got all these people who now have leave so if we go back and look at the employees dashboard if they go to leave they can cancel their leave but they can also see that their leave is ready to go so you've got a nice leave approval flow process it makes it very easy for the employee to go and request leave it makes it easy for you to approve that leave or deny that leave and give feedback if you want them to request it in a different way or if they did something incorrectly very great i think this is an awesome system it's very simple to use so there's leave requests it's your open source advocate and i'm back and i've set up a store with a little bit of merchandise i love being your open source advocate but i want you guys to be the open source advocates with me so if you want to get out there and get some of this stuff and if you do let me know what you think of it thank you for subscribing there you have it. That's Orange HRM for your human resource management needs. It's open source. It's really awesome. And I have just scratched the surface of what you can do with this software. So definitely go set it up. Try it out for yourself. See what you can do. See what you can do with it. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, like, subscribe, tell your friends about it so they can come along on the open source journey with us. And I'll talk to you next time.